In the next series of lectures, we'll take a close look at collections, in particular immutable collections that are used in purely functional programs. They're an important tool in a functional programmer's toolbox because they enable the expression of algorithms in a very high level and concise way. That, in addition, has a high chance of being correct. In this session, we'll start with lists. You've already seen lists as a fundamental data structure last week, where we discussed the core concepts. In this week now, we are going to show you how lists are defined in the Scala Standard Library and what kind of operations they support. So let's see how lists are defined in the Standard Library and what you can do with them. First, to construct a list having elements x1 to xn, you simply write list and the elements in parentheses. So here you see some examples. A list of fruit consisting of apples, oranges and pears. A list of numbers consisting of the lum numbers 1 to 4. And here's the diagonal of a 3 by 3 matrix represented as a list of lists. And finally, the last example is the empty list, which is simply written list of open parents, closed parents. Lists are sequences, just like arrays are, and you might know arrays from Java or C, but there are two important differences. The first is that lists are immutable, so you can't change an element of a list. And the second is that lists are recursive, while arrays are flat. In fact, you see the lists you see in the Scala Standard Library are very much like the lists that we have constructed from scratch uh, over the last week. The basic construction is exactly the same, the data structures are the same, but the lists in the Scala library carry many more operations that you can do with them. And in, the, in this session and the next, we are going to find out what these operations are. So just as a reminder uh, concerning the structures of lists, so if you have a list of apples, oranges and pears, then that would be represented as a list of cells, where the first cell would be apples, the second cell would contain as it had as its head oranges, the third one would be pears. And the right hand part of the last count cell is the empty list nil. To look at diagonal, so that would be a bit more complicated, so there we would have as a first element a list which is 1, 0, 0, and nil. As a second element, we would have the list which is 0, 1, 0. As a third element, then we would have the list which is 0, 0. One, and all these three elements are combined in a list, so it would look like this. So let's have a quick look at the list types. It's essentially the same as what we've constructed last week. So lists, uh, a list with string element is written list of string, a parameterized type. So fruit would be a list of string, numbers would be a list of int, diagonal 3 would be a list of list of int, and finally empty would be a list of nothing, a list that doesn't contain elements and is therefore a list of the bottom type of as, as element type. Now we've seen lists constructed homogeneously. We've written list and just all the elements in the list. But in fact, that's syntactic sugar for something more fundamental. All lists in Scala are constructed from the empty list nil and the construction operation, which is written as a double double point and is pronounced cons. So the operation x cons xs gives you a new list with the first element x and it's followed by the elements of xs. So that means that our previous uh, lists of fruit and numbers and empty can also be written like this. So fruit would be apples cons, a list oranges, cons, a list pairs, and then nil. That corresponds exactly to what we've drawn in the slide before. Numbers then would be similarly, and finally empty, the empty list would just be nil.
So again, note the similarity of what we've done last week with our simple list hierarchy. It's just where we were writing new cons x xs. Now we write simply x colon colon xs. In fact, there's a convention for Scala syntax which makes the cons operation look nicer. We have the universal convention that all operators that end in a colon associate to the right, whereas all other operators would associate to the left as usual. So that means that if you have two double colons like here, A double colon, B double colon, C, then that's really interpreted as A double colon and then B double colon, C. So the parentheses go to the right. And that means when you write a list like this, you can omit the parentheses because they would be redundant. So this list really means the same as what we've drawn before with parentheses going here, like that. The second difference concerning operators that end in colon concerns the ways they are seen of method calls. In fact, an operand that ends in a colon is seen as a method call of its right-hand operand. Remember, all other infix operators are seen as method calls on the left-hand operand. So the left-hand operand was the receiver. For operators endi ending in a colon, this is reversed, so it's the right-hand operand. And that makes a lot of sense because it means that an expression like this will really be expanded by the compiler to this sequence of method calls. So it's nil followed by the colon operation, that's the method call on nil, and we pass 4 as the argument to it, then we have another colon method call and we pass 3, then we have another one and we pass 2, and finally we pass 1. So each application of the uh, double colon cons operation prepends the argument to the list that was constructed so far. So double colon is really, with this convention, the same as the prepend operation we defined last week. You also know from last week that there are three fundamental operations on lists and that all other operations can be expressed in terms of these three. They are is empty, which finds out whether a list is empty. It returns true if it's empty, false otherwise. Head, which returns the first element of the list, exception if the list is empty. Tail, which returns the list composed of all the elements except the first. So these operations are, as you've seen last week, defined as methods on objects of type list. So for instance, you would write fruit.head and get apple, or you would write fruit.tail.head and get oranges, the second element in the fruit list. Uh, if you take the uh, diagonal of size 3, then its head element would be the first row, so that would be list of 100. Zero, zero. And if you take head of the empty list, then you would get an exception, a no such element exception, which would tell you that you have tried to take the head of the empty list. It's also possible, and in fact often preferred, to decompose lists with pattern matching. The patterns that you can apply to lists are exactly the same as the construction methods of list. So there would be a nil pattern that corresponds to the nil constant. There's a cons pattern that has a pattern in front of the double colon and a pattern afterwards. And the idea of that would be that this pattern matches any list whose head matches P and whose tail matches the second pattern, PS. And finally, there's a shorthand list of P1 to PN, and that's as usual, the same as the pattern P1, co cons P2, and so on, cons PN, and finally, a nil at the end. So let's see some examples. The first pattern here would match lists whose first element is a 1, whose second element is a 2, and the rest of the list is uh, arbitrary and is bound to the variable excess. The second pattern here would match lists of length 1, and the first element can be arbitrary and is bound to the variable x. The pattern list of x is exactly the same as x cons nil, so again, it's lists of length 1 whose element is bound to the variable x. The list of open parents, close parents, that's the empty list, the same as nil. And the pattern list of 2 colon xs, what would that be? Well, that would match a list with a single element, which is another list that starts with 2 and whose tail is bound to the variable xs.
So let's do an exercise. Consider this list pattern here. X cons Y cons list X as Y S cons Z S. What is the condition that describes most accurately the length L of the list it matches? Does it match lists of length 3 or 4 or 5? Or any list that whose length is greater or equal to 3 or greater or equal to 4 or greater or equal to 5? Well, let's have a look at the pattern again. So, what we see here is a list of three elements, the first named x, the second named y, the third is a list by itself. And then the rest of the list is captured by the variable zs. So that means that the list must have a length that is greater or equal to 3. The variable zs might be empty, nil, in which case the list would have a length of exactly 3, or it might be non-empty, in which case the length of the list would be greater than 3. So, so in any case, the condition that we're looking for would be length greater or equal 3. As another example, let's suppose we want to sort a list of numbers in ascending order. In fact, the standard uh, class list in the, in the Scala library has a sort function, but let's pretend it hasn't and we have to do it ourselves. So one way to sort the list, say, list of 7392, would be to sort the tail of the list. 392 sorted would give us list of 239. And then to insert the head of the list at the right place. At the right place means that uh, um, the it, it all elements that precede the inserted elements are smaller or equal, and all elements that follow are larger or equal. That idea is uh, insertion sort. Uh, so we would write it as follows. We would say, well, we have a function i sort for insertion sort. It takes a list of ints that gives us back a list of ints, which is the sorted version of xs. And we would say, okay, if xs is the empty list, then let's return the empty list. If xs is a list that consists of at least one element, call that y, and a rest ys, then what we would do is we would sort recursively the rest, the tail, ys, and we would insert y into the tail. What you've seen here is by far the most standard way to decompose a list. You would typically ask first, is the list empty? And if it's not empty, you would ask, well, what is its head and what is its tail? And all of these questions are expressed in the two patterns list of open parents, closed parents, and the cons pattern that you see here. So the definition of insertion sort is not quite done yet because we still have to define the function insert that inserts an element x at the right place of a list xs which is already sorted. I leave that to you as an exercise. As a hint, we would apply the same decomposition of lists that we've seen before, the standard decomposition, into a case where the list is empty and where it's a cons of a head and a tail. So all that remains is fill in the triple question marks here. Once you've done that, I'd like you to answer the following question. What is the worst case complexity of insertion sort relative to the length of the input list n? What I mean by that is, what is the number of steps insertion sort performs in our substitution model as a function of the length of the input list n? Does sort always take the same amount of time, no matter how large n is? So we would say sort takes constant time. Or does sort take a number of steps that's proportional to the length of the input list n? Or is it maybe proportional to n times logarithm of n? Or proportional to n squared? So let's see how we would answer this. Let's first fill in the insert function. So inserting an element in an empty list what would we expect to get back? Well, that would be the list that contains just the element to be inserted. Inserting x in a non-empty list, well, there would be two cases. The first case would be that the element to be inserted is in fact less than or equal to the first element to the list. In that case, we can simply give you x followed by xs. So we know that the element x will be the head element of the new list. Otherwise, what do we need to do? Well, the first element of our list in the other case where x is greater than y would be y, because that's the smallest element of all 
the elements that we've seen. And that would be followed by, now what we need to do is we need to have a call of insert of x into the remainder of the list, into wires. So let's look at the complexity. Now, looking alone at insert first, we see that the worst case would be that the element x is greater than all the elements of the list, in which case we would need n recursive calls for the insert function. So the number of steps of insert would be proportional to n, where n is the length of the list. Going back to insertion sort here, we ask ourselves how many calls to insert would we expect for a list of length n? Well, the answer is there would be one call for each element that we have in the list, so that would be another factor of n. So what we would get in the end is that the complexity of insert is proportional to n squared, which is actu actually not very good. So we will see in uh, a couple of sessions another way to sort lists th whose complexity is better.